Thank you so much for joining us today. While we give people a few more moments to sign on, please take a moment to type into the chat window the name of a favorite natural area that you enjoy visiting and where it's located. This might be a city park, a nature conservancy preserve, anywhere you go to enjoy nature. And while you type that in, we'll let the birds keep singing and then we'll move on. Thank you so much for sharing the names of some natural places that are special to you. It's great to see the variety of places that people enjoy and to get a sense of the states that people are calling in from. My name is Warren Mistel. I'm a Legacy Club Stewardship Manager. I'm hosting this call from the Maine TNC Chapter Office in Brunswick, Maine. Um, and I'm looking forward to enjoying some iconic Maine preserves with you today. Please notice the reminders on your screen. The first shows you where to type questions as they arrive, arise during this conversation. And the second explains how to take advantage of closed captioning. My colleague Elaine is gonna pop up a brief poll, which will give us a sense of how many of you actually reside in or have visited Maine, and whether any of you have visited the preserves that we're featuring today. And Elaine, if that poll is up, I actually can't see it. So, oh, there it is. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to jump in. The numbers keep moving around, but it looks like um, a number of people, many people, almost 70% have visited Maine or reside here. Many fewer have explored either of these preserves, which I think is perfect. That means this will be a French, fresh adventure for a lot of people. So let's head out into the woods. Let's hope we can get moving. Here we go. I asked that as we set off today, we acknowledge those who've walked this land before us. The rivers, forests, and coastline of Maine are the ancestral and current home of the people of the Donland, the Wabanaki Confederacy. The Abenaki, Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Penobscot, and Passamaquoddy tribes that make up this Confederacy have lived in close relation to this land for thousands of years. Yet today, they retain legal control of significantly less than 1% of their original homelands. Nancy Safera, Director of Land Management in Maine, is a colleague and a friend. And at this time of year, Nancy's often on the road visiting preserves that are scattered across the state of Maine. But when she's not traveling, she graciously shares her knowledge of the natural areas we have in such abundance in our state. And luckily for me, she kindly puts up with me and takes me foraging for mushrooms and in wooded areas near where we live. So at this point, Nancy, I'm gonna turn things over to you and ask if you're willing that you start with uh, naming some of the species of birds that we heard in that recording from the St. John Forest. Thanks, Warren. Good afternoon, everyone, or morning, wherever you're sitting. Um, the uh, birds that you heard were recorded in the St. John Forest two years ago, and some of the species that we're calling were oven bird, eastern wood peewee, least flycatcher, pileated woodpeckers were drumming, red-eyed vireos, black-throated green warblers, and hermit thrushes. Um, and just a little bit of background about me. I am the director of land management. I've been with the Nature Conservancy for 30 years. Um, most of those years have been in Maine. I started my career with the Nature Conservancy in Michigan and was there for about three years before I moved here. 
uh, I, my background is in wildlife biology, but I consider myself to be a generalist. So I know a little bit about a lot, but not a lot about very many things. So um, we are gonna visit three preserves in Maine. Uh, that's just a small sampling of the preserves that the Nature Conservancy owns and manages here. Um, we own and manage almost 290,000 acres across the state. And our preserves are scattered from York County in the very southern southwestern part of the state, all the way up to the St. John River Valley in the northwest part of the state. So today we're going to visit Berry Woods, Luthold Forest Preserve, and Boundary Mountains Preserve. We want to show you what the extent of the broadleaf temperate forest looked like historically across the globe. Um, and the reason why that's important is if you look at the red um, outline that includes portion, most of Maine and portions of the Northern Appalachians. Um, that's why uh, we're focusing on, the, on our site here in Maine uh, is because it's incredibly important to the, um, the broadleaf forest. And if you look at the, the extent of that broadleaf forest and how much it's diminished over time, Maine still shows up as a really important area for the broadleaf tempered forest across the globe. And so we considered, we continue to do our conservation work to help protect that, um, that uh, biome across the, the globe. We have 10 year strategic goals around our forest um, program here in Maine. And um, our, our primary goal is to protect forests for nature and people at a scale that matters. Over the next um, several years, we plan on uh, protecting over 350,000 acres of forest land and permanent protection. That could either be through direct uh, fee ownership, so direct ownership of the land or through uh, long-term conservation easements. We also wanna in increase the size of ecological reserves uh, so that we hit a threshold of about 25,000 acres at two ecological reserves across the state. And I'll talk a little bit about a week, what an ecological reserve is in a second. Um, other uh, goals that we have are to increase the forest carbon by 2.4% over the next several years. Uh, we want to improve science-based forest management, and we want to have a robust forest eco economy, because without a robust forest economy, um, it'd be very hard to con continue having a forest um, base across the state. So um, I mentioned ecological reserves. Uh, back in 2001, the legislature in Maine created ecological reserves on state lands. These were the best state lands in terms of the size and unfragmented forest condition, mature timber land on these properties, and good um, biodiversity. And so at the time that the, um, the state created these ecological reserves, the Nature Conservancy was very instrumental in, in getting that legislation passed and creating this system across the state. We made a commitment to also manage our preserves consistent with ecological reserve guidelines. So basically those guidelines say that um, we're gonna take mostly hands-off approach to management. We don't do any commercial forest management on these sites. Uh, we may do a little bit of forest management if we're trying to um, uh, manage for rare natural communities or rare species. But in general, we're letting natural um, disturbance shape the forest on these sites. So it could be wind throw, it could be ice storms, hurricanes, tornadoes, those kind of fire, those kinds of disturbance uh, features. And these sites are meant to be benchmarks against which we can uh, monitor change through time. So climate change, for instance, would be one example. We could also use these uh, sites as areas where we can compare these mature unmanaged forests against the, the um, forest composition and structure of our industrial timberlands in the state. For those of you that aren't familiar with Maine, two thirds of the, of the northern part of the state is in industrial timberland. Um, and so um, they're in what are called the unorganized towns. So there aren't any um, uh, towns with people, uh, local government. These are all um, the government there in these um, un, the unorganized towns is all uh, either state or county government. Um, and so there's very little um, human development in the North Woods. This is a, um, a short video of the Boundary Mountains Preserve and it shows the, the really good 
um, unfragmented nature of the forest there. And this is why it makes a really great ecological reserve. Our first stop is Berry Woods Preserve. Um, Berry Woods Preserve is located in the town of Georgetown. Uh, it's in the Kennebec Estuary um, along the Kennebec River. It goes from the, the preserve spans from the Kennebec River over to um, the salt marshes of um, uh, the salt marshes of the Robin Hood Cove. It's 377 acres. And if you look at the context of Berry Woods Preserve, um, in and around the rest of the, the conservation lands across this, the, this region. Berry Woods is in green. Uh, Josephine Newman Sanctuary is owned and managed by Maine Audubon. Kennebec Estuary Land Trust uh, owns and manages Weber Kelly Preserve and, and Morris Pond Preserve. Um, and then the state um, owns Reed State Park and Kennebec River Estuary Wildlife Management Area. And the reason why this context is really important is that there's connectivity for habitat going going all the way from the um the sheepscut um, river on the east side all the way over to the kennebec river um, on the, the west side and because there's so much connectivity in this area there's lots of habitat and ability for these larger mammals like like fisher and bobcat to be able to move uh, freely from one habitat patch to another We'll talk a little bit more about the um, importance of the habitat here in a second. Looking at um, this map, these are um, ecological features that are mapped through a program we have here in the state called Beginning with Habitat, where the state takes information on rare species, rare natural communities, and maps them, um, wildlife habitat, and maps them um, and makes that data available uh, to towns and organizations. And if you look at this map of Berry Woods on the west side, uh, there's um, significant tidal um, uh, uh, waterfowl and wading bird habitat. Uh, that's important for migratory uh, birds. It's also important for things like herons and egrets and, and, um, and uh, sandpipers as they're migrating through the area. In the center part of the preserve in the blue stripes um, area, that's inland waterfowl and wading bird habitat. Um, and that area is important again for migrating uh, waterfowl, but also um, for things like great blue heron that might have rookeries in these sites. And then on the, the east side of the property, that cross hatched area is um, salt marsh habitat that's really important for two species of um, salt marsh sparrows. Uh, that depend on that, that salt marsh grass habitat uh, for nesting uh, habitat. The yellow dots uh, that you see are long-term monitoring plots that we have scattered around all of the ecological reserves. We have over 500 plots on our land and there's across the state, if you include the state lands, there's over 1500 uh, plots that we monitor every 10 years across the landscape. And just to give you a, a, a visual of what some of these species look like, the salt marsh sparrow is in the upper left-hand corner. In the lower um, left-hand corner, the two dancing birds there are great egrets and snowy egrets are the smaller white um, uh, birds in the slide. And then the darker birds are the glossy ibis, um, which are relatively newcomers to the state of Maine in terms of um, their, um, their uh, nesting habitat here in the state. And then the right hand side just gives you an indication of what the habitat looks like for the salt marsh sparrow. Um, that is a shot of the Little River Marsh, uh, which is part of the whole ecosystem down here. In terms of the forest here, the um, woods is dominated by, uh, by oak pine forest. So white pine and red oak are the dominant plants, um, tree species here. We also have uh, an interesting uh, tree species here, uh, the pitch pine, which is a species that really likes nutrient poor soil. So really deep sand and gravel that's really droughty or um, very ledgy uh, rock outcrops that's very acidic. It doesn't need much moisture. It likes droughty conditions. And we have some pockets of pitch pine um, on Berrywoods Preserve. 
It's one of these species that really can tolerate being burned. Um, and so it's a fire dependent species. Although at a site like this, where it's growing on rock, rock outcrops, it's probably more the heat that's coming off those rocks that helps open the seeds and provides um, the habitat for these seeds to germinate. I mentioned the ecological reserves and, and um, um, the role that natural disturbance plays in shaping the forest composition and structure. In 2010, we had a microburst hit Berry Woods. Um, basically, these are very small tornadoes um, and create these small blowdown pockets um, on the preserve. We took, went out with a GPS unit and mapped all of the blowdowns that occurred from that storm. And out of 377 acres on the preserve, 52 acres were impacted by this microburst. And this is just um, a photo that shows just one of those microburst pockets. Um, when we have something like this happen, we leave all the down material there because that's the next cohort of um, providing organic matter to the soil. Um, if you look in the background uh, in um, an area that has more sunlight uh, hitting the ground, you can see how quickly the, the white pines have regenerated in the last 11 years. And this is exactly the kind of thing that we want to be able to track on our ecological reserves. The other thing that these ecological reserves are really um, important for is being able to track the impacts of things like pests and pathogens. Um, beach, American beech are um, pretty widespread in the landscape in Maine. Um, they're pretty important uh, late successional tree species. And in the 1920s, a pathogen that was introduced into Nova Scotia that then spread into Maine um, that created what's called beech bark disease. So there's a plant sucker, um, a little tiny bug that, that pierces the bark of the, the beech tree, sucks the, the sap out. And at the same time they do that, they inject this fungus into the, into the um, bark of the tree. So all those cankers that you see are the result of um, the impact of the beech bark disease. What this does is eventually it will kill the tree. Um, and originally we would have had very large clear bark beech trees across the landscape of Maine. These trees can get two, two to three feet in diameter. The old trees are really great as canopy, uh, cavity trees for wildlife, but now it's rare, really very rare that we see a beech tree bigger than 12 inches in diameter. They'll die before they get to the point where they can create really nice cavities, um, and then they'll stump sprout. And so we always sort of have beech on the landscape, but they never reach this old growth stage that you would normally have across our landscape. We also have some really nice vernal pools on the property. Um, and vernal pools are obligate um, habitats for species like wood frogs and um, spotted salamanders. And um, we're gonna uh, let you hear what the wood frogs sound like. Um, this was recorded this spring at Berry Woods by Warren, who basically told me that he fell into this vernal pool when he went there to do the, um, the recording. Yeah, it's, oh, sorry, I'm gonna go back. Let's see if I can get it to start. It's knee deep, I can tell you that much, this <laughs> vernal pool. Huh, they don't seem to want to sing for us. Oh, that's too bad. All right, well, I'll croak towards the end of this if, we need, if I can't get them to turn on. Yeah, okay. we'll just have to move ahead. All right, so um, some of the species that we find on the preserve, this is of course a very small spatter, smattering of the species we have there, but I did mention the um, connectivity uh, of the habitat that allows for the movements of these mid-range, mid wide-ranging, um, mid-sized wide-ranging mammals, including the fisher, uh, which is found on the preserve. We also have other predators that are on a smaller scale like the gutter snake that will feed on, on insects and amphibians and small mammals. And then the, the bottom left hand is, is the spotted salamander um, that um, uh, needs these vernal pools for reproduction. And here's a, a shot of what the preserve looks like on the, along the shoreline of the Kennebec River. Warren and I had a chance to go out earlier in the spring to go do some, uh, some uh, birding. Uh, the warblers were just starting to come in. And I think it was the first day that I heard an oven bird and a um, black-throated green warbler for the year. So it was a beautiful day. 
And with that, we're going to move up the coast to the Luthold Forest Preserve, not up the coast, up to the, nor uh, the northwest part of the state, um, to the Luthold Forest Preserve, which is up near Jackman. Um, and this is an area that um, we've done a bit of conservation in uh, the last couple of years. If you look at the background, we're looking off the top of Number Five Mountain, which is one of the high, high peaks on this preserve. And we're looking north. And if you look in the, the mid ground on the right side, you can see a, a pond that's surrounded by an area that doesn't have any trees on it. Um, that's Number Five Bog. So when we originally um, protected this property, the Nature Conservancy protected about 10,000 acres that we retained ourselves. And we also protected 5,000 acres um, of the number five bog. And number five bog um, is also includes a, a rim of the Moose River that runs along the south and west side of the, of the preserve. And um, the Moose River is part of this really big bow trip that um, a lot of people take every year. It's a multi-day trip that you can do a complete circle that takes you down the Moose River and across Addy and Pond and then back to your starting point. Um, and so it's a really important area, not only for eco ecology, but also for uh, recreation. So just looking at, um, at uh, the map of this area, if you look at um, the green area, that's the Luthold Forest Preserve, the, the area just south of the Moose River Number no. 5 bog uh, was the original 10,000 acres that we protected. And then we added on another 6,000 acres that included the top of Number 6 Mountain. Um, and um, so we have Number 6 Mountain, Number 5 Mountain, and then um, the Moose River Number no. 5 bog was transferred to the state when we did this, prop this um, acquisition. The state also owns a big unit uh, called the Holub unit off to the, the west there. And then the, the straw covered colored property is a co big conservation easement that's um, held by the Forest Society of Maine. And so you can see from a conservation perspective, um, there's probably about 30,000 acres that's in conservation in this one area. In looking at the map of the ecological features um, that um, is mapped through beginning of, with habitat, over on the west side of the preserve, there's a really good um, qu high quality spruce fir northern hardwood system. So again, the dominant species there would be spruce, uh, balsam, red, typically red spruce, balsam fir, um, the northern hardwoods would be yellow birch and uh, American beech and sugar maple. And then the subalpine uh, fir forest over on the top of uh, number six mountain is dominated by balsam fir and a, a birch tree called uh, heartleaf birch. And then there's a lot of rock, rock outcrop systems on top of that, those mountains. In the center part of the preserve where it's not quite so um, mountainous, there's a lot of inland waterfowl and wading bird habitat. So again, habitat for, for herons, and spotted sandpipers, solitary sandpipers, and, um, and a variety of waterfowl. And then if you look on the, the eastern, at the eastern end, there's a pocket of teal that's labeled as jack pine forest. Jack pine is a boreal tree. It typically grows um, farther north in these monocultures. So it'll be in this blanket of nothing but jack pine. They periodically burn. Um, and when they burn, they burn in what's known as a stand replacing fire. So basically the fire burns everything in that area. Um, the heat of the fire allows the trees to release their seeds and onto what's a freshly burned um, surface. And that freshly burned surface, because it gets down the mineral soil, is perfect for these seeds to, to germinate. And then the, the whole cycle starts again with the forest uh, growing in an even aged uh, stand. That doesn't quite happen here. Um, we don't get those um, broad scale, large jack pine stands, but it is a pretty significant um, tree species here because it's at the southern limit of its range. Um, it gets down into sort of the Great Wasp Island, um, Mount Desert Island area, um, and then across to this part of the state. And so it's a pretty interesting um, natural community. It does actually extend down onto the property that we own as well as um, uh, a good suite of red pine that also likes to be burned. 
Um, and again, those yellow dots are all of the long-term monitoring plots we have on the property. And just wanted to leave you with a, a, a drone um, video here of the south side of number five mountain. And pay particular attention to some of the rock outcrops and cliff faces. So one reason why, whoops. I'll back up, sorry. <laughs> so one reason why I wanted to show those cliff faces is there is habitat there on um, some of number five mountain and likely number six mountain too for peregrine falcon um, as nesting habitat. We also have a suite of neotropical migrants um, that nest on this, on, um, this area. So the upper left-hand corner is, uh, left-hand slide is um, black Bernian warbler. And the other thing about the Moose River, it's a very slow moving river. And one, it's probably known as the location in the state that has the best population of wood turtle, which is the turtle on the lower left hand um, portion of the slide. Um, these turtles are semi aquatic, they spend a lot of time underwater. And we'll um, take a little flight around the Toby Ponds. Uh, the Toby Ponds is a chain of ponds um, just east of um, Number Five Mountain, and is a really popular uh, trout pond. On the slopes of number six mountain, uh, and a little bit around number five mountain, we have what are called talus slopes. And these are um, slopes that are just a jumble of boulders and rocks um, that are sort of loosely um, uh, layered on top of the ground. So they have a lot of these little cavities inside of them. One of the things that um, about Maine is that we don't have very many natural caves in the state. Uh, we don't have sort of the limestone systems that they have in Kentucky or Tennessee where they, they're a really big bat hibernacula. And instead, it's likely that bats when they hibernate in Maine, they may be hibernating in attics, but they also would um, hibernate in a, in a um, small scale in some of these talus slopes where there are um, openings that they can get into. And one of the things that's, that could be happening in some of these, these hibernacula is that because the bats aren't all congregated together um, in these large hibernacula like you get in Kentucky and Tennessee, they may not be passing white, white nose fungus back to one another. Um, white nose fungus is a fungus that was introduced from probably Europe, it was probably accidentally introduced to caves on spelunking equipment, the caving equipment. Um, and what it does is it causes the bats to wake up in the middle of their hibernation in the middle of the winter. And because of that, they don't have enough resources built up um, in their, their fat reserves in order to make it all the way through hibernation. And so they'll die um, part, part way through the winter because of that. And so we're hoping that some of these, these talus slopes uh, provide some good wintering habitat for our bat species. The other thing about number five and number six mountain is that it has really good nesting habitat for Bicknell's thrush. Bicknell's thrush is a relatively uncommon thrush. Um, it nests on top of these mountains that have um, a, a sort of um, rock outcrops interspersed with low conifer species. Um, and um, so the, the um, Bicknell's thrush are, um, have been verified on top of number six and number five mountain. And just to give you an indication of what their song sounds like, it, they're very thrush-like when they sing, but they're a little bit different than other thrushes. Oh, I did not want to sing for long, Nancy. Oh, was that it? <laughs> Let me try again. All right.
let it rest. So our last stop is the Boundary Mountains Preserve. This is our most recent acquisition in terms of a, a new preserve uh, where we acquired 9,608 acres um, about a year ago. And the significance of this uh, particular preserve is that it protects a couple really um, fairly high mountains, Caribou Mountain and Merrill Mountain. We purchased the entire township of Merrill Strip. And this get, gives you an idea of how unfragmented the forest is on this particular property. Um, this was drone footage that was taken last summer. The um, uh, preserve is pretty interesting uh, because it, for the last 20 years, there has not been any uh, commercial timber harvesting on it. Uh, and there's very few roads that go into this preserve. Um, and so it's pretty different than a lot of the sites that, uh, that we own and manage. This is a map of the property. It's right up against the Quebec border. So all of that um, white area is Quebec. The um, area in um, Quebec is part of the crown lands. And so as you go on that side of the border, it's all um, forested, unlike a lot of the border along Quebec, which is highly developed. If you look at the cross hatching on the map, um, that is a, uh, Bicknell's thrush habitat. And if you look at the red um, lines, the red polygons, uh, those are the recent harvests. And like I said, there haven't been very many harvests in the last 20 years. Um, and most of those harvests have re really been concentrated in the lower elevations of this particular property. Um, the other thing that's really important for this site and some other sites where there's a lot of elevational change is that as our climate warms, um, species can move higher in elevation to get out of the higher, higher temperatures and find refugia of, of habitat in which they can still uh, thrive on the property. On the lower slopes of the mountains, uh, it's dominated by a really rich uh, northern hardwood forest. I think the soil here is a little bit sweeter than other parts of the state in that it's not quite as acidic as other parts of the state. And the, um, in the springtime, it's just a blanket of these ephemeral early spring wildflowers like trout lily and Dutchman's bridges, which basically just line the entire understory of the forest. This particular preserve does not have very many ponds on it. Um, un unlike some of our other sites that have these really large remote uh, ponds, but it does have a lot of good stream systems. This stream is called number one stream. Um, I don't know where they came up with their names, but uh, not very elaborate. So number one stream uh, is the major stream that flows through the property. And as you can see in, the, in this photo, it has a lot of nice, large logs in the stream um, uh, system. And so uh, it provides a lot of good essential habitat for, for species. And then the, the forest is intact on either side of the stream system. There are some small scale uh, beaver flowages on the property. Um, there are some, some of these uh, grass openings too that are left over from some of the past logging. And, um, and some really interesting little wet meadows that are interspersed through the forest here. And the other thing that we have here, of course, is the iconic Maine moose. Um, everybody loves seeing, seeing moose. And it's really interesting on this particular preserve because there are a lot of moose. As you can see by the right-hand side of the screen, that's all moose poop. And, um, it's a, a, a area that um, um, an area that one of our, our staff took a picture of. One of the things about the population of moose, moose on this particular property is that they eat a lot. And because they're eating a lot, they actually will impact the um, regeneration of a forest. So things like balsam fir, they love balsam fir, they love um, uh, the sugar maple and, and striped maple. And so there are trees that will never reach the canopy because they get, keep getting repeatedly eaten by the moose as they're, um, they're foraging. So it's kind of an interesting thing on this particular preserve. 
um, of the density of moose here. Other species we've, um, we've identified, of course, are, are black bear. There's a nice uh, print of black bear in the mud, uh, white-tailed deer. We're in the very early stages of learning about this preserve. And so we're comp compiling a species list and doing a natural resource inventory um, so that we know what uh, features are on this pro particular property. Now we want, just wanted to show you what the boundary line looks like between the United States and, and Canada. Um, this is the boundary along the Quebec border. It's about um, 75 feet of uh, completely uh, uh, cut vegetation. Uh, we walked up and down the, the um, boundary line uh, all the, one of the times we were there. And uh, luckily there weren't any um, drones or anything that came flying overhead. I don't think we tripped anything off, but. Uh, it's pretty interesting to come out of the woods and see this big swath through the middle of the woods of the, on the, bar, the border between the two countries. Yeah, I have a feeling some satellite was watching you. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. That's a ton of information, and I'm sure it's going to generate a lot of questions. So what I think I'll do is pause for about 20 seconds, give people a chance to type their questions in, because it can be hard to type and listen at the same time. And then I'm going to start you off with a couple of questions that were submitted earlier. So we'll give people a little bit of time to type. Okay, questions are piling up. So I'm gonna get us started, Nancy. The first question has to do with whether or not trees actually do talk to each other or maybe communicates the better word. I actually love that question because, um, you know, I think it's it's pretty clear that there are interactions going on between um, between trees, um, either through communication through the root system or um, uh, communication through the mycorrhiza, the fungus that um, that interact with the tree species. And there's a really great book if you haven't had a chance to read it, is the Hidden Life of Trees. Um, the that book is written in a really general way that gives a lot of really cool information of how um, trees communicate with one another. Um, I highly recommend it. And the second question you touched on, but um, how do these preserves, I guess all of them, but let's say these three preserves in particular, help mitigate the challenges of climate change? Yeah, if you start down in um, at Berry Woods, um, Berry Woods, because it, it spans from one, one side of the um, the peninsula to the other side, um, when there are issues like um, storm surges or issues like sea level rise, there are places for salt marshes to migrate um, over time. And so that large amount of protection uh, is really important. The other thing, the connectivity, as the climate warms, species are gonna need to be able to move. And so if the habitat is not connected in one way, there's no way for species Especially, well, some species can move, but um, for the ones that aren't very mobile, there's no way for them to move to new habitat patches, especially when you're talking about things like plants. Um, the other thing I talked a little bit about is the elevational gradients. As um, you have these elevational gradients, if the species are able to move higher in elevation and find cooler temperatures, they can move to new, um, new habitat patches um, through that seeking out uh, cooler temperatures. The Nature Conservancy has um, this huge data um, uh, system called the Connected and Resilient, Land Resilient Landscape. It basically takes the, the data from um, uh, uh, elevational data and other geographic data and also looks at what areas have good con connectivity. And we can identify areas that, are, that we know or we think are gonna be more resilient to climate change um, than uh, um, some other areas. And so we can focus some of our conservation work there. The other thing I would say too, is that we've done some um, work on uh, some of our properties where there has been um, uh, past uh, logging um, prior to our, our ownership, where they may have taken out say all the conifer species out of a, of a mixed wood species stand. And because of that, because the whole 
um, species mix isn't there, um, it's less resilient because if there's a pest or pathogen that takes out one tree, say all the beech trees, um, there's no other tree species to take its place. And so we're trying to put some of those components back into the forest so that the forest is more diverse and able to um, survive uh, the impacts of climate change. Great, thank you. This next question harkens back to that slide we showed that showed a global change and the broadleaf forest. What changes of broadleaf forests are you seeing in Maine due to climate change? Yeah, the, the, the big um, thing that I would identify right now is around pests and pathogens. Um, you know, we haven't seen, there are some small areas where we've seen some impacts to, um, to forests, say if it's right along the edge of a um, salt marsh. You know, there's some areas where you see forest decline along those, those areas because they're getting salt inundation. But we have um, emerald ash borer, which has just come into the state that's um, likely to really um, kill the majority of our ash trees. We've had Dutch elm disease, so the, the um, amount of uh, elm trees in the state is pretty um, sparse. You know, we, we've had chestnut blight in the past, we have the beech bark disease. And because of all these, these pathogens, and you look at something like brown tail moth, it's likely that brown tail moth is spreading across the state um, farther than it has uh, in the past couple of decades because of the temperatures are warming. Um, uh, another um, example would be um, the um, Hemocolis adelgid. That species was never able to tolerate cold temperatures in the winter, but we don't have cold temperatures in the winter anymore. And so it's expanding. So those are the kinds of impacts that I actually worry about um, quite a bit um, with the, the temperate broadleaf forest. Thank you. All right, here's one. Um, how's the lumber business managed and the Nature Conservancy's preserves in Maine? Yeah, so we only do, um, the only place where we do currently are doing any commercial um, timber management is on the Upper St. John uh, Forest. So that's 160,000 acres of forest land that we purchased from International Paper um, over 20 years ago. And in order to be able to pay for um, owning that property, because we have to maintain roads and bridges and things like that on a very large landscape um, and pay taxes. We do some um, commercial timber management on that property. One of the things we've recently done is enrolled in the carbon market there. And so we, over the next 10 years, will only be able to harvest about 15% of what, what's called the annual allowable cut. And so um, basically your, your allowable cut is based on how much volume your forest um, um, grows in a, on an annual basis um, so that you're not taking out more volume than what you're growing. So we're, all, we're gonna be only harvesting about 15% and then we're getting payments through the carbon markets um, to offset the loss in timber. And we're trying to do um, the forestry that is going to um, help increase the size of the trees. Um, and so, you know, it may be uh, harvesting at a, a slightly lower volume level when we do actually go into some of these stands to do harvesting. And I know it's not lumbering, but you want to mention the sugar bush, it's sort of an interesting way that we use our land. Yeah, so the, the most recent thing we did about three years ago, uh, we identified about 1,500 acres of um, hardwoods on our property that were dominated by sugar maple. And we decided that um, because it was in an area, uh, the way we have this property divided, we have about um, you know, half of the property is set aside in reserves that we're not gonna, we're not gonna do any harvesting because it's real, the forest is in really good shape. And then we have an area where we've set it um, where it's called our managed forest, where we might do commercial forest management. This 1,500 1, acres of sugar maple was in that managed forest area. And it was in good enough shape where we decided that rather than getting income by cutting the trees down, we would get income by, create, by leasing that area as commercial um, maple production. And so we have a, um, a gentleman from Quebec who leases that sugar bush from us. And he's been tapping for, um, I think this is his, he just got done with his third season of um, uh, maple syrup production. And he pays us by the tap. So the number of taps that he puts in the trees, 
um, is the amount of uh, how we get paid um, on that lease. Do you have any idea how many gallons you produced last year? I, I don't, yeah. I know I ate at least one of those gallons. <laughs> yeah, I want to. <laughs> um, so this question actually works for B3 preserves, or, and I don't know if you remember it mentioned at the beginning how many preserves there are in Maine, but what is the impact of development pressures on these preserves and Maine in general, I guess, as well? Yeah, so, and especially in the last year, um, you know, with, with COVID, um, the real estate market here is going crazy, just like it is everywhere. Um, and in Southern Maine is where we have, um, so York County, uh, our York County, um, Cumberland County, um, Sagadahawk County is probably where we see the biggest impact in and around our preserves in terms of development. One um, site we have, Wells Barrens, um, down in York County, the number of houses that have gone in around that particular preserve in the last um, three or four years has been um, pretty incredible. I and mean, there's a new subdivision coming online. Um, it seems like, you know, every six months or so. Um, and so there are, there is quite a bit of development pressure in the southern part of the state. And it, we're starting to see that in um, places that we wouldn't normally see it. So I've been told um, in the town of Lincoln, which is, um, for those of you who aren't from Maine, is sort of on the threshold of the North Woods um, as you're getting going north of, um, it's north of Bangor area. Uh, I heard that the, the number of, um, of uh, the, that the real estate market there has sort of went nuts the last year. Did you freeze up? If Nancy froze for a moment. Nancy, are you there? Allison, do you hear Nancy? Would you slack me if you do? Nancy, you might try turning off your video. Oh, I think she's going to sign back on, so we'll have her in just a moment. All right, well, feel free to take this time to keep typing in questions. I meant to have a tree joke ready, but I don't have one. You're back, Nancy. Thank you. Phew. Oh, you're muted though as well. Sorry, my internet went out. <laughs> I've been doing that. Okay, so this next question is perfect for you because you're an expert in this field. Can you talk a bit about how much Maine ha um, sort of has managed burns and do we have mega fires like we do in Western states and our blowdown areas a, a concern in this regard? That's a great question. We do um, prescribed fire in York County. Um, we do prescribed fire mostly on a couple sites, uh, sand plain grasslands and pitch pine barrens. Um, these are fire maintained sites. They're on really deep deposits of sand and gravel. Um, and we're doing burns um, on these grassland sites about every five years. And then in the pitch pine areas about every 12 to 15 years. Maine does not have huge wildfires. We had um, somebody do some, um, some research in the North Woods on a, um, one of our big preserves up there, the disturbance history and the return interval of fire in that part of the state is like on the, you know, over a thousand years. Um, I think I remember him saying something like 8,000 years. And when you think that Maine was glaciated, um, you know, up until about 12,000 years ago, um, that means one fire. So we don't have these huge wildfires. I would say that most of our fires, um, are probably you know less than a thousand acres at the most. The biggest fire in recent history has been 1947, when over 100,000 acres burned in the state of Maine. And that year, um, there was uh, there was no rain between July and October. Um, it might have been November actually by the time the fires were done. Uh, and you know, keeping in mind back then there weren't that many roads and the equipment wasn't very good. And so the ability to actually fight fire um, was much less. 
The nice thing about um, what's happening now is there's more and more interest in the state of people wanting to do, use fire for, man, for um, management. And I think that's a good thing um, because the use of prescribed fire, especially in these dry sites, um, keeps the fuel down. And it does mean that you're likely to, to not have these really devastating wildfires. The one thing that we don't know what's gonna happen is with climate change. Um, we, we've been getting drier during the summers. And so that may mean that we'll have more severe wildfires as the climate um, changes. Um, and the other thing we don't have in Maine a lot, we don't have a lot of thunderstorms. And so the lightning driven fires are usually not very common. I hate to do this. I think we have time for two more questions. I think we could go for hours. So this next one is a multifaceted moose question. So are there natural predators? Do we call them if the natural predators cannot keep up? And apparently they seem to defecate in the same area, sort of like rhinoceros do. Is this, is this the case? They pick a favorite trail and decide, okay, this is, the, this is us. Yeah, so we do have natural predators. Um, you know, the, the scale of predators that we have, um, we do have, you know, coyote, bobcat, lynx. Um, seems like the predators that we do have um, tend to like things like snowshoe hare, so they're on the smaller size. We don't have wolf, we don't have mountain lion anymore. Um, and so, um, the and right now, you know, if you look at most of the state, um, in the North Woods, there are a lot of areas where we have lots and lots of moose. Um, and then in the south part, the southern part of the state, there are areas where we have too many deer. And so the, you know, if anything, we could say that there's probably not enough predators. Um, and regarding the, the question of, um, do they tend to stay in a, um, in a place and, and do the, the sort of have the latrine thing going on? Uh, there certainly are mammals like otters that do have, um, have areas that they uh, defecate in all the time. And so you find these latrines, what we call latrines out in the, in the woods. Um, and they'll tend to use the same trails back and forth um, to um, some of their habitat patches. That's a nice word for it. Okay, the last question, I'm afraid. Um, can you talk a little bit about how Maine includes, or TNC in general, but maybe here in Maine specifically, includes um, indigenous communities in its work? Yeah, so this is something the Nature Conservancy has really started digging into quite deeply in the last couple of years. Um, globally, uh, we're working with indigenous peoples across the globe. Here in North America, we have an indigenous, indigenous learning team um, that has been working on um, helping staff uh, with, uh, with a sort of toolkit of how to, how to work with indigenous peoples. Um, we have a team here in Maine that has been uh, working on this for a couple of years. There's something in Maine called the First Light Learning Journey, um, which is a, brings uh, conservation practitioners together with some of the tribal members um, to talk about and learn about um, indigenous peoples. We're a, very interested in indigenous ecological knowledge and looking at ways um, that we might partner with, um, with the tribes either on co-management or giving them access to cultural resources like sweet grass, or um, brown ash, uh, which is two species that they use for their basket making. Um, we also just recently, and this was just announced two days ago, um, worked with um, the Passamaquoddy tribe to, um, to help them acquire uh, a piece of property in Big Lake uh, called Pine Island, which was, is a site that has cultural significance for the tribe. And so they're, they're now, uh, once again, the, the stewards of that, that island. And so it's a, it was the first um, project that we've been able to do um, in, with that, uh, in that regard. And so we hope to continue doing that work. Um, we're all, uh, everybody on staff is, is really learning. Um, this is all very new to us. So it's a kind of exciting um, new learning opportunity for us. Thank you, and Darcy posted an, uh, a link to an article from the Portland Press Herald in the chat window about that very land purchase. So again, Nancy, thank you so much for your time and your wisdom today. I feel like we've been lucky to catch up with you. I know you're so busy at this time of year. And I'd like to send a huge thank you to our Legacy Club members who are on this call, whose forward thinking planning is 
is critical to our ability to preserve land like that which we visited today and to our other supporters whose partnership we value tremendously. Um, my colleague Darcy is posting a link to a brief survey and the chat feature. I hope you'll take a couple minutes to fill it out, please. Your candid comments help us preserve, um, plan future events like this one. We will send an email next month with a link to all of the virtual field trips once we've wrapped up the series. We look forward to seeing you on our three upcoming virtual field trips that are scattered over the next few weeks. Uh, and again, I just wanna thank you so much for joining us. It's been wonderful to have you and to explore Maine with you. And should you find yourself in Maine, oops, let me just share this, make sure you have this slide, um, the email address that shows you where you can register for upcoming events. And you can also email us to ask us questions. But again, thank you for being here today. And if you find yourself in Maine this summer or anytime in the future, please don't hesitate to contact me if you'd like a list of recommendations of preserves that you can visit near where you happen to be located. Darcy will put my email address in the chat feature. And we'll leave those links up for a few minutes so you can click on them and find the survey and that sort of thing. So again, again, thank you so much for being here. And I look forward to seeing you in Maine sometime. Bye-bye.